el relator de Naciones Unidas, Oliver de Schutter, eh, que como sabéis eh, está en su cargo desde 2008 y es relator especial para el derecho a la alimentación. Entonces, después de este vídeo, está en inglés, yo lo siento, pero no nos da tiempo a hacer la traducción porque nos llegó ayer eh, y, y es complicado. Yo voy a hacer como un resumen de los principales puntos que él ha tratado. Gracias también a José Luis Vivero, que me ha estado ayudando hace un ratito. O sea, que esto es una colaboración colectiva. Vale, pues lo vemos. Good afternoon, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Olivier Deschuter. I am the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, appointed to this position by the in 2008. Um, and it is my great pleasure to salute this 25th anniversary of the Spanish um, International Cooperation Development um, Agency, IACID, Um, and to congratulate the agency for the very, very important work it has been doing on the right to food over the years. I am now um, entering the final phase of my, of my mandate uh, as Special Rapporteur on the right to food, and I think it would be useful perhaps for me to, to sum up what we have learned and where the consensus today is about why the right to food is useful and what are the next priorities in improving um, food security in combating hunger and malnutrition. Let me perhaps uh, first of all note that um, we have been witnessing over the past five, six years a major revolution in how um, we should eradicate hunger and malnutrition. In the past, the idea was a very simple one, that uh, we should increase production by uh, encouraging the most efficient producers and the most uh, efficient regions to boost production and for those regions and producers to feed the others. Um, the regions who would be food deficit regions would benefit from trade and aid in order to allow them to satisfy their food needs, but um, by trade realization and by um, encouraging the competition between farmers it would be possible to raise output by the most competitive uh, producers for all the world. And this approach that has been characteristic of much of the 20th century has now shown um, to present many limitations. Um, today the consensus is um, rather that we should support all countries' efforts in increasing local food production, in supporting their own farmers, to reduce dependency on, on food imports for, from international markets, but also to reduce rural poverty by investing in the poor farmers, in those who work on the most marginal environments and who often practice um, uh, small-scale farming in very difficult conditions. And in large, um, to a large extent, the reason why rural poverty has not been um, Uh, reduced as much as it could have been is because we've neglected to invest in those small farmers in that type of family agriculture um, where the quickest gains could be achieved in the reduction of rural poverty. So instead of um, um, encouraging efficiency, uh, large scale uh, um, and uh, uh, food surplus regions, feeding food deficit regions, um, today the emphasis is on deconcentrating food production and in, in encouraging each country, each region to, um, to feed itself and to have the ability uh, and the support to do so. That was the first revolution we've witnessed. Uh, there was a second revolution, which is uh, a consequence, if you wish, of the first, that we needed, um, and that is the new approach, we need today to, to support more local food systems. Um, In the past, most investments, most efforts went into strengthening export-led agriculture. Um, uh, infrastructures were geared towards supporting the producers who had um, uh, the best chances of competing well on international markets. And the um, emphasis was on supplying global markets uh, with uh, uh, cheap foodstuffs. Um, as a result, 
small scale food, local food systems have been underdeveloped. And in many cases, small farmers had no access even to their own local regional markets. So we need to reinvest in rebuilding these local and regional markets by better connecting small farmers to the urban consumers and by rebuilding these connections between the rural areas and the urban areas that often have been neglected in uh, the past uh, approaches to, to development. This is a way both to provide access and thus incomes to small farmers for whom local markets are much more accessible than, than large markets and global supply chains, but it's also a way to allow poor consumers in the urban areas to benefit from nutritious, fresh foods rather than having to depend on um, foods that have a long shelf life and that are sold in, in supermarkets uh, under conditions in which food is, is very heavily transformed, processed and is often um, less um, adequate for healthy diets. So that's a second revolution that took place, a shift from uh, supplying global markets uh, with commodities uh, that uh, would be convenient inputs for the food processing industry to a situation in which we put emphasis now on, on producing um, um, fresh foods, um, serving local markets in shorter food chains. There's been a third revolution, um, and that revolution concerns um, essentially how to make this transition towards um, helping each country and region to feed itself, towards rebuilding local food systems, given that the mainstream, the dominant food system, is so inert and so difficult to displace as a result of a, very, of a number of, of lock-ins that make it extremely um, uh, difficult to, to change. Um, these lock-ins are well known. They are social technical lock-ins. Uh, the, the infrastructures that have been built, the storage facilities that have been built, the processing facilities that have been built, the communication routes that have been built have generally served large-scale uh, producers, um, the agro-industry, rather than uh, these facilities having connected small farmers to, to market. So um, these technologies that have been developed, these infrastructures that have been developed, have been uh, developed by and for um, the agri-food industry rather than um, for these farmers, uh, the, the, the poor, the small farmers, that have been neglected in the past. Um, we have also socio-economic lock-ins um, in that the system as it has developed has seen the birth of uh, very large um, agri-food companies who have been very effective in um, um, uh, developing logistical means to connect um, producers with faraway consumers. Um, these companies are extremely efficient at producing um, um, food at low prices for large populations and at um, increasing volumes of production. Um, as a result, they are highly competitive and their dominant position leads to further dominance as small farmers are driven out of business because of this competition that they face. So this socio-economic obstacle is a second obstacle that must be addressed. A third obstacle is what might be called a, a social cultural obstacle and that concerns the tastes of um, consumers, the habits of families, the lifestyles that we've developed. We um, like food that is processed, that is easy to prepare, that tastes good and we've become addicted to food that is um, heavily processed but also as a result uh, quite heavy in, in saturated fats, in, in sugars and and salt, and that is not necessarily the best for adequate healthy diets. Uh, but that too has been one major obstacle to change in recent years, the habits of consumers and the difficulty to shift to more sustainable diets uh, because of the, um, the tastes that consumers have developed in the past. There's a fourth lock-in, a fourth obstacle, that I would like to call social political, and that is the very dominant position that some actors have come to occupy in the mainstream food system, um, allowing these actors to basically veto any significant change in the system and making 
it difficult to overcome um, the, the obstacle that they constitute for a transition towards sustainable food systems. So how to overcome these lock-ins? How to um, circumvent these obstacles? How to make a transition towards um, food systems that are um, uh, uh, more resilient, that are better for health, that support small farmers so that rural poverty can decrease and local food systems re-emerge um, despite these food systems have been, having been neglected in the past um, 30 or 40 years? Well, the answer, in my view, is, is food democracy. The answer is to allow um, uh, citizens, um, consumers, to um, uh, share uh, with producers, to share with retailers, to share with public authorities um, um, a space in which um, new food systems can be imagined and built from the bottom up. And I'm very encouraged over the past five or six years to see how, how many local initiatives have developed that seek to create connections between these different actors to rebuild local food systems and to circumvent these um, obstacles in making a change in the dominant, dominant food system. This is extremely encouraging to see how many alternatives have emerged and how food democracy has been making progress by more political space being given to, to consumers um, to link up with, consumer, with, um, with producers, with retailers and with um, agri-food companies in order to imagine other alternative food systems. Um, food democracy is very key, and, and this is why the right to food is important. Um, IECID has been supporting um, many movements that support the right to food, many is initiatives that um, seek to realize the right to food, and it has been especially key in this major effort to strengthen accountability in food systems uh, that was developed in Latin America under the name of the Iniciativa Latin America y Caribe Sin um, that was um, developed um, in, a, in a number of countries in, in Latin America and the Caribbean region to um, encourage parliamentarians and governments to move towards increasing accountability, participation, non-discrimination in the, in the food systems. Um, this very important initiative in which the uh, regional office of the FAO in Santiago de Chile played a major role, has been extremely important in um, encouraging Latin American countries to really take the lead in developing national strategies for the realization of the right to food, framework laws that um, encourage um, um, civil society organizations to work with all actors of the food chain and with the governments to, to strengthen um, access to food for poor populations. Um, why is this important? It's important for um, essentially three reasons. First, the right to food as it is conceived and developed by national strategies and by framework laws um, is um, there to encourage participation, uh, ensuring that the decisions that will be made by governments as to how to invest, as to uh, whom to support, as to how to um, protect poor consumers from the impacts of high prices, for example, um, that these decisions will be made with information provided by the representatives of the poorest segments of the population. In other terms, um, um, we cannot support the poor without the poor, and the right to food um, requires that we involve the poor in shaping decisions that will affect them and that is of importance to them. So this is one major contribution of the right to food. It is to encourage this participation, which is not only a source of legitimacy, it is also a source of um, um, effectiveness because the decisions will be better informed by the views of the poor. Secondly, the right to food means greater accountability. Uh, for many years, governments were not held accountable for their choices in agricultural and food policies. As a result, they were very often dominated by um, major lobbies and, and, and large, powerful um, companies dominating the sector without um, them having to justify the choices they make in the light of um, um, the uh, needs of the poorest segments of the population. So if the right to food means greater accountability, it would mean decisions 
that are better um, suited to meet the needs of the poor, and it will mean governments that will um, more transparently make decisions um, and better use the resources at their disposal to improve the situation of the poor. Um, thirdly, the right to food beyond participation and accountability means non-discrimination. It means that all people, all uh, women, men, children, should have the same right to support if they are under the same conditions, without discrimination based on ethnicity, based on political um, affiliation or political loyalty, without discrimination based on, on family ties or on um, other forms of, of, this, of um, um, uh, other types of criteria. Um, in many countries in which I traveled, I noted that um, the farmers that were best supported were the farmers with the best connections um, to uh, the administration, farmers that uh, um, were nearby the urban centers and could more easily have access to support, or um, the elites that could uh, benefit very often um, disproportionately from the various support schemes that the state had put in place. This, of course, is, is not correct. It is the poor who should be targeted by the efforts of the government, but this requires that a strong requirement of non-discrimination be imposed in all agricultural and food policies. And the right to food is about this. It's about um, accountability, participation, and non-discrimination being at the center of the agricultural and food policies that are developed by, by governments. So um, these are, in my view, some of the major achievements that we've seen over the past five or six years. You see the food systems have changed much more since 2008 than they've been changing over the previous 25 or 30 years. This is a time of revolutions. It is a time of significant rethinking about how we should invest in agriculture and food systems, how we should support access to food for the poor, and how we should make the connections between um, agricultural production on the one hand and other issues such as public health, such as rural development, such as the preservation of the ecosystems and environmental concerns that in the past were considered um, apart from how agricultural development should proceed. And today we need a much more holistic approach based on the right to food, based on recognizing the needs of the poorest, and, and this is to a large extent what the programs of IECID have contributed to, particularly, I must say, in Latin America, where its presence has been extraordinarily effective in um, making this revolution happen in, in Latin America. Latin America, as I noted in a report I presented to the General Assembly um, of the United Nations um, at its 68th session in, in October 2013, um, Latin America has been really leading um, the world in showing how the right to food could make, could make a significant difference in um, improving access to food for the poorest segments of the population. And uh, the Spanish um, um, International uh, Development Cooperation Agency, ICID, has been um, playing a very important role in, in getting this message across and in, in providing support for this, um, this revolution to take place. So for this, I'm extremely grateful. I, of course, regret that I'm not able to, to join you um, 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 in, in Bolivia um, um, for this uh, very important um, anniversary meeting that was convened by ICID. I'm extremely indebted to ICID for its support over the years. Um, I, I hope uh, that uh, the debates will be fruitful. I have no doubt that they shall be um, um, useful in identifying the challenges ahead. Um, let me again thank you for allowing me to participate, uh, albeit virtually, in this discussion, and I look forward to our um, future collaboration. Thank you. Fundamentalmente, eh, y muy resumido, los mensajes de Olivier de Suter eh, serían que el sistema alimentario ha, cam ha cambiado más desde el 2008, eh, fecha de la crisis mundial de alimentos, eh, en estos seis años últimos que en los últimos 25 o 30 anteriores. Ello es debido a que estamos en un tiempo de cambio y de transición alimentaria muy importante. Eh, había un anterior paradigma en cuanto al tema de la agricultura y la producción intensiva. Eh, se trataba de producir intensivamente en algunas áreas 
y exportar a otras, producir a un precio muy bajo para intentar que, que los productos fueran competitivos en otras zonas. Eh, se intentaba buscar la eficiencia eh, produciendo o, o llevando a cabo una agricultura de gran escala con una mecanización y una intensización, una, haciendo intensivo todo el tema. Eh, planteando un mercado global eh, con los alimentos como commodities, o sea, como otro producto más, eh, y de hecho eso es una de las consecuencias de la crisis mundial de alimentos, ¿no? y el producir para exportar comida barata y en muchos temas pues muy poco saludable. Eh, y finalmente eh, todo ello conducía a marginar a los pequeños agricultores y a los propios agricultores de subsistencia no, tienen, no teniendo acceso en muchos casos a la propia producción de sus, de sus alimentos para, para sobrevivir en, en, es, en este sistema digamos, agroalimentario. Eh, fundamentalmente el mercado tomado como tal pues era el rey del, del tema. En el actual paradigma en el que estamos en este momento, en el periodo de transición, estamos intentando tener sistemas alimentarios locales y regionales, eh, donde los propios países están buscando su propia autosuficiencia alimentaria y, y donde se trata de primar lo local y, y lo propio antes que, que lo externo. ¿no? Apoyar la producción nacional para reducir la dependencia alimentaria, nosotros a eso le llamábamos en, en algunos temas también soberanía alimentaria. Él no ha utilizado ese tema, pero eh, por ahí quizás van las cosas. Producción más ecológica con pequeños y grandes, y, eh, con pequeños y grandes productores y eh, hacer que los circuitos digamos, de la cadena de valor sean muchísimo más cortos. En definitiva, se trataba reclamar el control de la cadena alimentaria para productores y consumidores que son digamos, los grandes beneficios. Por un lado, deberían ser los grandes beneficiarios de, de esta cadena y a, hasta ahora han sido los grandes olvidados. Eh, luego, eh, ¿cómo hacer, eh, el reto que planteaba era cómo hacer la transición alimentaria, esta transición que estamos planteando, y eh, qué aporta al, a la misma, a todo este nuevo cambio, eh, el enfoque del derecho a la alimentación. Eh, él plantea que hay una serie de barreras, de obstáculos al cambio, y el sistema alimentario y las grandes corporaciones alimentarias mmm, tienen mucho poder, tienen mucho poder eh, y evidentemente eh, este tipo de obstáculos son eh, de técnicos, el tema de grandes y muy largas cadenas de producción, donde al final el productor es el que menos recibe, porque cuantos más intermediarios todos sabemos, el precio va aumentando, el, el, el consumidor... Co lo compra mucho más caro y el productor lo paga, o sea, se lo, se lo paga más barato. Eh, unas barreras económicas, el sistema alimentario de low cost, un tema de incentivos y, y subvenciones. O sea, todos conocemos las políticas de, de algunos países, por no mencionar la política agraria común, eh, la política de Estados Unidos, de Australia, etcétera, poniendo aranceles y, y primando unas producciones de sus propios agricultores. ¿no? Hay unas barreras culturales, un tema de hábitos, de sabor, de, de, de sabores que nos han educado a que eso es lo bueno. Eh, por ejemplo, Coca-Cola, porque es el sabor que nos gusta, porque hay detrás hay una serie de investigaciones de unas marcas, de unas corporaciones, unos, estila, unos estilos de vida rápido donde comemos el fast food, donde nuestra alimentación es cada vez menos nutritiva y más problemática para nuestra propia salud. Una comida, eh, y además está ultra procesada, pérdida de, de minerales, vitaminas, etcétera, etcétera. Y luego, finalmente, él habla también de unas barreras políticas. Fundamentalmente, eh, hace, hacía menciona que había unas empresas transnacionales alimentarias eh, que son enormes en la economía mundial. Concretamente, este sector, el de la alimentación, el de la agroindustria, eh, es el segundo sector más importante en el mundo después del sector energético. Curiosamente, eh, cuando hablamos de hambre, pues no hay unas barreras técnicas. O sea, la producción de alimentos está ahí, pero 
hay todo este tipo de barreras que, que, que están influyendo en ello. ¿no? Entonces, él plantea como solución a, a, a estos obstáculos un término que denomina democracia alimentaria. Entendiendo por democracia alimentaria la construcción de un sistema alternativo que se basa en compartir espacios, espacios, poder y a través de los sistemas locales y de los propios, desde los productores, to, todos los, toda la escala que está implicada eh, en el propio sistema, ¿no? eh, ejerciendo un mayor control de la producción y el consumo por parte de los actores importantes en el tema, que serían productores y consumidores, la sociedad civil, etcétera, implicado en el tema. Y luego, finalmente, hay otro apartado, otros dos apartados que él menciona, que sería el papel de la ECID eh, en todo el tema de seguridad alimentaria y nutrición y cómo él lo ha visto eh, reflejado la importancia de la actuación de ECID en América Latina. Él hace mención a una cosa muy importante, yo quiero que, que quede aquí como mensaje para debate de estos días. Él dice que América Latina y Caribe, Está, los países de América Latina y Caribe están a la vanguardia de la promoción del derecho a la alimentación en el mundo y eh, eh, son líderes en sus avances legales y políticos. Eh, están fortaleciendo, o sea, fortaleciéndose a sí mismos los países eh, en el tema de derecho a la alimentación. Y luego hace una serie de, de menciones y luego, él no lo dice, pero ya de paso lo digo yo, que podemos eh, sacarlo en el debate, el papel de la agencia que ha estado apoyando eh, la iniciativa América Latina y Caribe sin hambre, por ejemplo, eh, como la apropiación de los países eh, latinoamericanos y de Caribe de, de un, por ellos mismos de una serie de, de políticas públicas que pueden incidir en, en toda la reducción de hambre. Y el papel que ha, hecho, eh, que ha jugado AICID en la sombra en este tema y la propuesta que yo planteo para debate, no es de Oliver de Schutter, pero es mía, es cómo podíamos trasladar esta experiencia exitosa de, desde América Latina a otras regiones del mundo que están ahora eh, con este tema. Yo me lanzo y me atrevo, porque estamos aquí ya entre amigos y creo que hay que empezar a lanzar ideas de este tipo, eh, con una cooperación triangular. Eh, la agencia ha aportado una serie de, de voluntades, eh, de, de formación técnica y de experiencias. A los países de América Latina y Caribe, los frentes parlamentarios y los propios países, los gobiernos, tienen eh, la legitimidad de las actuaciones que están haciendo en legislación y en actuaciones. ¿Y por qué no hacemos esa cooperación triangular? Países de Latinoamérica y Caribe agencia y llevar, llevándola, por ejemplo, a África. A lo largo de estos días hablaremos con el subdirector de, de la agencia eh, de cooperación con África subsahariana y veremos cómo nosotros también estamos cooperando allí. Pues una de las cosas que se les puede intentar trabajar podría ser en este ámbito. Propongo, yo, así, me lanzo. Y luego, él... Eh, Paso otra vez a lo que él decía. Aicita ha jugado, según él, un papel destacado en ese impulso a través de, eh, primero, la priorización de este tema de la seguridad del derecho a la alimentación en sus programas y, por supuesto, colocando fondos. Por eso él está agradecido también porque lo hemos estado financiando, su, su actuación, a través de organismos multilaterales, sobre todo en FAO, que, que ha quedado un poco patente en la mesa anterior ya cómo está nuestro apoyo, pero también en PMA, en FIDA, eh, en ACNUR, en la oficina del relator. O sea, hemos hecho muchas cosas eh, en este tema. A través de ONGs españolas eh, hay una campaña de derecho a la alimentación promovida por una serie de ONGs españolas para la sociedad civil española allí y para todos los demás países aquí, aquí donde España coopera. Y luego, en el marco de la Iniciativa América y Latina y Caribe sin Hambre, eh, promoviendo las estrategias nacionales SAN y las leyes que se han estado aprobando en los distintos países. Y finalmente, él eh, ha resumido eh, tres aspectos claves de cómo el derecho a la alimentación influye en todos estos avances que él promueve. Eh, uno, eh, promoviendo la participación inclusiva en el diseño, ejecución y monitoreo de programas de lucha contra el hambre. El segundo, 
eh, llevando a una, una mayor rendición de cuentas y transparencia de los actores gubernamentales. Eh, fundamentalmente, él ha mencionado en algún momento un mayor apoyo a los pobres, cómo se puede llegar a ese mayor apoyo a los pobres. Luego, eh, eh, la tercera sería la no discriminación. No discriminación ni de mujeres, hombres, niños, mayores. Todos tienen los mismos derechos a ser apoyados y considerados y no pueden ser discriminados en base a ningún criterio en este momento. Y además promoviendo una focalización basada en las necesidades de los más vulnerables. Eh, fundamentalmente ha mencionado también pues, cómo el derecho a la alimentación incide puede incidir en la agricultura, eh, en temas como salud, cambio climático, etc. Y eh, cómo deberíamos eh, intervenir en todo este ámbito. ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues nada más. Recordar solo que los líderes eh, latinoamericanos mm, son en este momento mm, o pueden ser en el tema del derecho a la alimentación líderes para el resto del mundo.